You think you're lucky to survive this plane crash, but it turns out you've cheated death and now it's hunting you down for revenge. It has the most insane death traps planned that you will never see coming. Your destiny is to die in a brutal way and you can't escape. What do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat death's design in Final Destination. All these kids here are doomed. A class is headed to Paris for a school trip and they're excited to leave. The kids are herded into the airport and the teacher stops them to take a head count. There's Carter the jock and his girlfriend, the loner chick, and there's Alex with his best friend Todd. Now this kid has a serious fear of flying and I can't blame him, but there are signs here that something terrible is going to happen. And they may all seem like coincidence, but none of them are. A creepy guy hands out a flyer for the Hare Krishna movement, who believe in reincarnation after death. As he checks in, he's told that the time his flight leaves is the same as his birthday. And statistically, more people die on their birthday than any other day of the year. The departure board is wildly flipping out, the plane looks really old and damaged, and when he's taking a pre-flight dump, he hears John Denver playing on the bathroom speakers, who also died in a plane crash. All this sounds like pure coincidence, but trust me, paranoia is your best friend here. If you had a healthy respect for superstition, you might think twice about stepping on that plane. They board the flight and his friend tries to reassure him no god would let this plane crash. It has a baby and a disabled man on board, but it's not reassuring at all. He sits down and is clearly freaked out. Two of the class hotties ask if they can trade seats with him and he goes to sit with his best friend Todd but discovers the tray latch is broken. This plane is falling apart and it's not comforting. They take off and it's a smooth ride. The class begins to applaud, but Alex here is not convinced at all. Suddenly, the cabin starts shaking, the bags start falling out of the compartments, and the oxygen masks drop from the ceiling. The plane is out of control. This is everyone's worst nightmare. An explosion erupts, and the fire cooks his face off. It's brutal. And then he wakes up. He's back on the plane as if none of it happened, and the girls ask if they can switch seats again. What's going on here? He rushes over to sit by his best friend and the tray latch falls off, just like before. He screams that the plane is going to explode and of course, he sounds completely f***ing crazy. He gets into a fight with the jock and security comes in to drag them off the plane. Okay, only 1 in 11 million flights actually crash, but this is not just paranoia anymore. We can save 287 people right here and we need to get everyone off the plane in case that vision was real. The easiest way might be to just say there's a bomb. It's dramatic enough to make everyone leave and not just those who happen to get swept into your mess. They don't know this yet, but because everyone's cheated death, it's coming back to kill them in the order they were meant to originally die. So by getting everyone off the plane and saving 287 people, you've given yourself a lot more time to live because there's more people in line to die before you. The loner chick feels like something is up and decides she needs to get off too. The students and teachers are thrown out and the captain won't let anyone back on but the teacher argues that the students need a chaperone, so he makes an exception. The male teacher offers to stay, but she refuses, encouraging him to go ahead. He boards the plane and they take off, leaving the stranded students behind. Okay, I'm just gonna say, if he had made a proper bomb threat like I said, this plane wouldn't be taking off right now. The teacher asks Alex here what happened and he tells her about his vision. They're a little freaked out, but the bully gets pissed off. He can't go to Paris now because this kid is scared of airplanes and they start fighting. Everyone gets up to stop them, and none of them notice that the plane has just exploded. The blast shatters the windows, and everyone is horrified to see that this paranoid kid was actually right. Okay, it wasn't a dream. It was all real, 100% confirmed. So we need to figure out what exactly happened, but the only place it exists is in this kid's head. I mean, look at him. He must be going through PTSD. That means his memory of all these details won't be as reliable after even a few hours. You need to write down everything you saw in the vision immediately. The survivors are taken into a room where they're interviewed by two FBI agents. They try to find out how the kid knew the plane was going to blow up, but he can't give a good answer. It's clear they suspect he's the cause of the disaster, and they'll be keeping a close watch on him. Now we have to be really careful here. Whatever we tell the agents, they'll either think you're crazy or that you've just killed 287 people. I'd want to blame it all on this guy, but the best move is to tell the truth. They won't believe you, but that's okay, because crazy is sexy, and this girl digs it. One month later, the survivors attend a memorial for the victims of the crash. When he lines up to pay his respects, the bully is overly aggressive. Billy here thinks he's a psychic, and his teacher is terrified of him. Even his best friend isn't allowed to talk to him. That night, the kid takes a break from researching airplane disasters to study up on human anatomy. An owl interrupts his private time, and he tosses the magazine to scare it off, shredding it apart. 
a piece flies out and lands perfectly on his lap with his friend's name. Just like his vision, this is no coincidence. His friend is in serious trouble. Todd here has no idea what's about to hit him. He sees a dark shadow in the mirror, and when he turns on the radio, it plays the same John Denver song he heard at the airport. He never notices a trail of water snaking its way towards him. He slips with a puddle, knocking over a bottle of shampoo, and gets choked out by the clothesline. The bathtub becomes too slippery for him to stand. No matter how hard he struggles, he can't get out of the tub and dies. Holy crap. Just when you think you're safe at home, you die in a freak accident. But we all know this is not an accident. Poor Todd here was first on Death's list, but he didn't have to go out this way. He could have pushed up on the faucet and used his pants to prevent slipping so he can get the leverage to unwind the cord. But sadly, this death was completely necessary because this is the proof that death is coming for us all. If I knew that key piece of information, I'd make all survivors pair up for protection. It's unlikely they'll both die at the same time, so whoever's next will have someone around to save them. This method will reveal death's pattern and make us all a little safer. The kid runs to his friend's house and finds out he's dead. The dad blames the kid for his son's death, but the kid knows that's not what happened because he was given a sign and it makes him wonder, will he die too? The next day, he visits the loner girl to talk. Now if it's me, I'm using that finely honed paranoia to my advantage. Walking into this girl's house, I'm already looking at everything that could kill me. I mean, look at all this dangerous shit around. And this girl's got a bit of a secret. She can somehow feel his emotions in an evil presence that's latched onto him ever since the crash. Whatever this thing is, it's coming after them until they're all dead. The only question is, who's next? The kid knows his friend didn't commit suicide, but he needs to get proof. Looking for answers, the two of them break into the mortuary like it's Mission Impossible. They find his friend's body lying on a slab and get caught by this really creepy mortician. And this guy knows way too much. He tells them their friend didn't commit suicide because there were marks from him trying to call the wire off. The mortician confirms that death has been hunting them down ever since the plane crash and the kid realizes what he has to do. They leave the funeral home and sit down to talk at a cafe where the kid explains if they somehow find out who's supposed to die next that they can try to prevent it by saving that person and cheat death once again. He sees a bus in the window but when he turns to the street there's no bus there. It's another vision of the future, and his spidey senses are telling him something bad is about to happen again. Strangely, all the remaining survivors show up at the coffee shop. The kid almost gets into a fight with the jock, but the girlfriend tells the two boys to move on with their lives as she steps onto the road. Okay, it was clearly her time to die, but if she knew, she probably wouldn't have stepped out into the road like that. But now that she's gone, someone must be next. So how do we figure out who comes after her? Thankfully, we've written down all the details of the premonition from earlier. This is going to pay off huge. When people start dying, the pattern will emerge and you can compare it to the notes you took. It will start to match up and you'll be able to determine who's next in line to die. That night, the kid sees a news report of the crash and it reveals how the plane blew up. He traces the explosion and realizes there's a pattern here. It perfectly matches where all the survivors were sitting. He's figured out Death's design. They were being killed in the order they would have died if they had stayed on the plane. It started with his best friend, then the girlfriend, which means the next person to die will be the teacher, and he's got to stop it from happening. Okay, we finally have the pattern we've been looking for, so at this point, I'm only thinking about how to prevent my own death, no matter who I have to hurt. So I would lock whoever's next in the safest environment I can possibly think of with food and water. If I can keep that person in a death-proof prison, I'm free to live my life without worry. The teacher freaks out when she sees her student is in her front yard and she calls the FBI. He checks her car for signs of tampering, but he's caught by the feds. They take him away, leaving the teacher alone with the cold wind of death. She plays a record and unfortunately it's John Denver again. And as we all know, that's not a good sign. As she's wiping down a kettle, a dark shadow is reflected in its surface. When she pours herself a hard drink, the bottom of the mug cracks, leaking vodka all over the floor and even in her desktop. She notices the computer starts smoking and gets closer to inspect it. The screen suddenly explodes, throwing her back and launching a glass shard into her throat. Sparks from the computer ignite the trail of alcohol and the flames follow her into the kitchen. It reaches the bottle, which erupts into a massive explosion, knocking her to the ground. She reaches for a cloth and pulls out a knife block that sends one of the blades into her chest. Now there's so much that's gone wrong here, I have to address it. If this teacher knew she was next, she wouldn't be so careless. Putting hot and cold liquid into a mug will crack it. If your computer is frying, then obviously unplug it. Taking the glass out makes you bleed out faster, and for God's sakes, leave the towel there. She had so many chances to live, and she had no thought of calling 911 throughout any of it. Meanwhile, Alex here has been let go by the feds after a failed interrogation, 
and he races over to his teacher's house to make sure she's okay. He finds her lying on the floor with a knife lodged in her chest and he tries to help, but the oven explodes and knocks a chair over and hammers the blade deeper into her body. Like an idiot, he pulls a knife out, leaving his fingerprints all over the murder weapon. He realizes his mistake and runs out of the house seconds before it explodes. The next day, the FBI shows up at the girl's house. They found evidence that the kid was at the teacher's house last night and want to know where he is. Lying, she says she doesn't know anything. Okay, these agents aren't going to leave us alone. There will be a lot of dead bodies by the time this is over, and these guys will demand an explanation. I would make every survivor wear a body cam to record what happens to them, so that if they die, we have a database of undeniable evidence that points to supernatural shenanigans. I won't have to deal with murder charges and can focus on actually surviving. Later that night, she meets up with him, and he's feeling stressed from this whole situation. She opens up about her own past. Her dad died when she was young and wishes he had a second chance. They're lucky to be alive, and she tells him he can't give up. They meet with the remaining survivors who have heard about the teacher's death, and they ask the kid if he knows who's gonna die next. He tells them it's better if they don't know, and it freaks the jock out. Okay, the kid is dead wrong here. If I knew the order of death, I'm telling everyone. If you don't know you're next, you'll make stupid decisions and put yourself in dangerous situations. And that's not just bad for you, it's bad for me. Because the faster people die, the closer I am to death. The jock has a meltdown and starts driving like a lunatic. He can't escape death, so he might as well end it all now. That's when the kid sees a freight train in the window's reflection. It's another vision of the future. The jock stops the car in the middle of the railroad. Everyone else runs out, but he stays behind and they beg him to leave the car. As the train draws closer, he changes his mind. He doesn't want to die today, but when he tries to drive away, the car won't start. The doors suddenly lock and the seatbelt won't budge. He can't escape. It looks like he's the next one to die. Seeing that the train is going to hit him, the kid tries to pull the jock out, but he's trapped by the seatbelt. There's no way they're going to make it. But at the last minute, the belt rips apart and the two boys barely avoid getting crushed to death. He's cheated death for the second time. Billy here starts freaking out. He doesn't think it's safe to be around them and wants to leave, and he should have because the train launches a piece of metal straight at him. His head rolls to the ground. But wait, this isn't supposed to happen because the kid knew the jock was supposed to die. This means the death order skips to the next person in line when you save someone's life. Now we have another strategy at beating death by its own rules. I would make a man-made trap where you can easily save someone's life, which lets you skip the death order basically as many times as you want. Everyone should serve some time as the next person to die, as long as it's not me. Taking shelter at the loader girl's cabin, the kid tries to death proof the building because he thinks he's next to die based on his cheat sheet of death. He's even eating cans of mush so that he won't choke. Instead, death tries to take him out with a fishing pole that yanks the door open, causing knives to fall, but he closes it in the nick of time. Alright, it's all good effort, but this is not a solution. I mean, look at this place. There's opportunity for death everywhere. When friends get killed by clotheslines and shampoo, it means you don't know what's dangerous until it's already killing you. Start by getting the most obvious things out of the way first. Electricity power in your home? Not anymore. Access to fire? Not anymore. Butane gas? Knives? Technology? No, no, no. It might suck, but if you want to survive, you'll have to live about some conveniences from now on. But the kid suddenly realizes he's overlooked an important detail. Unlike his premonition, he never actually switched seats with those two girls on the plane. According to the death order, whoever sat in front of him should be next. He doesn't have to save himself, he has to save the girl. He runs out of the cabin when suddenly the police come rolling up. They found him and they want to bring him in for the teacher's death, but he gets to a boat and rows frantically across the lake. When he makes it to the other side, he runs to the woods with the cops chasing after him. At her house, the girl realizes she's next as a lightning bolt breaks a telephone pole and sends the power lines flying. When she tries to rescue her dog, she almost gets skewered by a drying rack. Then as she's making her way back to her house, the pool gets punctured and floods the backyard. She leaps into a trellis to avoid getting electrocuted. It's clear, death is done being sneaky. The girl climbs back into her house as all the lights explode. She runs to the garage to drive out, but she gets trapped in until she reverses far enough that the piece rips off the ceiling. It looks like she might make it, but the power line falls into the hood, short-circuiting the car. She's completely stuck, and to make matters worse, a trail of turpentine is snaking its way to her. This might seem hopeless, but there's a way out. Any metal you touch in the car will electrocute you, so you need a good insulator. I would collect all the rubber car mats and use them to open the door and walk out. That way I don't come in contact with the car or the ground. 
The kid finds her and realizes she's going to get electrocuted if she touches anything. He tries to beat the wire off, but accidentally breaks open a gas canister that lodges itself underneath the car and sets it on fire. Seeing no other option, he sacrifices himself to break the deadly cycle, giving the girl enough time to escape as the car explodes. His plan worked, but it doesn't look like he survived. Are they actually going to kill this guy after everything he's been through? No, they're not. Because six months later, the remaining survivors, including Alex here, are reunited in Paris. Wait, they're in Paris? That means these guys actually got on another plane? That's a really bad idea. Everything is going great, and they all think it's over, because it's been six months since anyone has died. But he can't help feeling like something's wrong. He takes out a diagram of Death's order and points out that while he interviewed to save others, no one intervened for him that night. He should still be next to die. The jock teases that maybe he still is, and the kid begins to sense bad omens everywhere, like a guy playing John Denver and a canister knocking over a bucket of nails. Fearing the worst, he walks away from the table, but the girl warns him just in time to avoid a bus. He almost gets hit and sees how this motor accident knocks out a massive sign that comes swinging for him. He saved at the last second but the jock. But since his death was prevented, who's next? The order comes full circle, and the sign comes swinging back. But what do you think? How would you be Death's design? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.